It's easier for people to bond over things they don't like as much as what they do. Saying very clearly, here's what we're not, by definition tells people what you also are. By trying to not put people off, you're actually never attracting anyone either. Over our experience, we don't agree with tying people into three month minimum term contracts. In this video, we are going to talk about psychographic alignment. Ooh, Ooh, big fancy words. What is it? Uh, hey guys, we're Dan and Mike from Business and Banter, formerly Biceps and Banter. And we're here today to help you with your online fitness business. I can't say that word anymore. Um, in any way we can. You're struggling with that, aren't you? Yeah. It's the two S's, I think. Fitness, business. Fitness, business. 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 Uh, in any way we can. So today we're going to talk about psychographics and demographics, which was, um, we did this uh, a longer form of this uh, training for our members group uh, about two weeks ago now. I mean, it's it a depends, good on, depends on when it's going to come out, really. Uh, just convenient then everyone start talking about it after that. I think the, the rats got in there. Yeah, we the think uh, we think we think this video in the members group got copied. Yeah, it's just well, it's just convenient that we discussed it, and then within three days, other people were discussing no, it. Less than that. Oh, less than that. Yeah, it was, it was less quick. Than that. Wasn't it? It's just because like the, the word psychographic alignment, it's not something that crops up that that often, is it? It's it's quite a specific um, <laughs> kind so, of like... It's not just general conversation every day, yeah. is it? Yeah, with that. It just seemed a little but strange. The other thing thought. as well that we did, when we did the training as well, the thing I thought was funny from doing it is we, we called it, you know, the, from, the, from the video we said psychographic alignment, but actually when we looked at it and broke it down, it's everything that we've ever recommended people do anyway. So, head of the game, in a way. Anyway, we've always been talking about this sort of stuff. It just um, fits nicely with the psychographic versus demographic, which is kind of what we're going to kind of come on to, is that previously, most mentors, all they ever talked about was having a demographic or a niche we'll just talk about in a second on what that is what that looks like um and we've always done we've always recommended coaches go with a more psychographic view of things and we're going to get into that in, in a second talk you through um the things that are different within that and what what you need to focus on when it comes to understanding your this is niche i suppose to a degree yeah so this is just um again we'd be lying if we said that we um sat down and kind of wrote all this stuff out six years ago in, in fitness business but um the the more that i kind of like looked into this so i was reading a reading a book um 10x is better than 2x um and it kind of went into a few elements of 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 this and the more that i read the more i was like we do that we do that that's what we say like mm -hmm. and it was a really nice way to kind of package it so what do we mean when we talk about psychographic so you probably hear of um mentors ourselves included um talking about you need to know your niche. What is a niche? Now, what we usually see people do when they try to target a niche, they go gender, age, profession. And that's it. What they tend to do is go, who's got most money? Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurs. Like, who's got I most work with busy entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's what they think that a niche is, whereas a niche can be broken down into your demographic and your psychographic, okay? So a demographic could be it could be a gender, it could be a profession, it could be an age, that could be the demographic side, but it's not enough. The psychographic side is the personality trait, which is arguably more important than the demographic. Everybody focuses on their age, their gender, etc. You, If you go back historically in our fitness business, it wasn't you know gender specific it was slightly slanted towards males because of the branding biceps and banter and the lad style humor but we still attracted females there was certainly no age range there certainly wasn't a profession involved and again you can kind of look at other people in the industry for example let's look at like a callum raystrick a pro coach again would he conform to a niche that how other mentors would teach it there'll be different ages there'll be different genders and they'll have different professions. That niche is goal specific. They're trying to turn IFBB pro. So they could be male or female. They could be a teacher, a plumber, um, a lawyer, an accountant. It could be anything, a coach, and they could be any age. So niche can be something different. A lot of businesses do this, and this is what we would be teaching, and we've always said this. So the types of things that fall into a psychographic would be, are they a football fan? Do they like the office? What's their sense of humour like? Is it sarcastic? Is it dry? Um, do they like to play golf? Are they a dog owner as well? Um, what sorts of food do they enjoy? Um, those types of things. Annoying. So well, switch it off. That's part of it. That's so part of it. You get more out of it. Trust me. Yeah. Um, you know, those are, really big the, the, <laughs> those are the sort of things that you should be connecting to the audience with. 
everybody just goes down this route of <laughs> trying to hit pain points of a specific age and profession and so on and so forth. Instead, you need to align to your psychographic. Yeah, and it's and it's, it's what we talk about all the time is like <clears throat> sharing your own life and sharing what you do because you're far more likely to align with someone based on the things you already do. We're not telling you to go and start playing golf to try and attract people to play golf. That's not what we're saying, right? Because people will think that maybe. It's going to be do what you do normally and you'll align with the right type of people based on that. So we always drop in office quotes into our videos. Some of you may be watching this going, what the fuck was that? That wasn't even, I don't even know what that is, right? I don't care because I know what it is. He knows what it is and it's funny to us. And there's half of you that do find it funny because you do like the office because you're the right type of people. They're cracking us. up. They're cracking up. Because there's nothing vicious, right? Prime example. But it also doesn't take away from our message in any way, shape or form either. And coaches are so afraid of sharing these things of who they might put off without realizing that that's exactly what you need to do to attract people. And that by trying to not put people off, you're actually never attracting anyone either at all. Like it's, 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 it's real basic. I say real basic marketing. Like it's, it's, it's just fundamental human psychology. It's, it's not even marketing. It's just human beings being humans. They all want to be part of something and they want to be around people who want to be a part of the same types of things. Football fans is a great example. That mob mentality of football fans. It's why the same people, why do, why do you not just like football? Why do you go and watch Man City, not Man United? Why do you have a rivalry? Because ultimately it's just 11 blokes kicking a ball around on a field. Or why? Women. Huh? Or women. Wow. They don't really kick it, though, do they? Can't say that. That's a joke. It's just cancel a joke. Him. Can't, don't cancel me. It's just a joke. Um, they can't run either. Um, <laughs> just, joking. Hips. just joking. Just joking. But like, why, why do they have this such strong attachment to that? And again, it's the bond that they share based on the, the team that they support and the trials and tribulations that they all go through, the emotions, the highs and the lows. But when we look at it on a, on a, on a, on just on a very basic logical level, it makes no sense that they would hate each other based on the football team that they like to watch. But it's because as humans, we like to feel as part of a pack, like to be a part of a unit of people who are going through the same sorts of things. And it's exactly why psychographics is hugely important. Yes, yeah, it's... it's um it's evolutionary. One of the biggest human fears is is public speaking. And I, I think there's a certain percentage of people that actually fear hu uh, public speaking more than they fear death, which is bizarre. It's basically built from the fact that we don't want to stand out because standing out means that you're separate from the pack. That means that you could be liable back in the day to being ostracized and, and eventually it would lead to, to death in a, you know, He's not dead. Um, in a in a worst case scenario, but it it stems from people wanting to belong to the same community that has shared beliefs, and that's where you'll get people like an Andrew Tate that is very opinionated, that's very brash, that's very loud, that will start to appeal to a psychographic. The demographic is probably male, but they're probably all different age ranges. They're probably all different financial statuses. They're probably all in different professions. But the psychographic probably means that they've got shared beliefs, that they do similar things. They probably see themselves as this alpha male, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see it within other things. Um, so, for example, coffee. The demographic is they want coffee, right? They like coffee. They're probably old enough to afford a co coffee. You look at the different psychographics that coffee houses tie into. So you have like a premium coffee house or a Starbucks, Starbucks will tie into the fact, the psychographic, that they're not a coffee snob. They don't produce the what is termed as like the nicest tasting coffee. I don't know. Dan's more of a coffee snob than me. I'm more Starbucks or Costa. Dan's more premium coffee house, right? It ta so Starbucks design their marketing, their branding, and even their products around it. That's why you'll see in a Starbucks a Frappuccino, a fruit cooler. They'll do other items as well. Gateway drugs, isn't it? Uh, and Frappuccinos. Like yeah. Get people involved in coffee. Yeah, into like, it. yeah, because it's not for the coffee snob. It's for the person that likes to have a coffee whilst they're socialising or whilst they're doing mm -hmm. work. That's the psychographic that they're going after. The psychographic that a premium coffee house would go after would be the coffee snob because everything is focused around More the beans, intelligent, better the looking, roast, yeah, whatever. Those people. <laughs> yeah, the gimps, um, <laughs> the people with no friends. Um, because everything is geared around the roast, the beans, the the, the, the coffee. It's probably done in a certain way. They Takes probably longer. don't have, <laughs> yeah, they probably don't have um, sugar-free vanilla syrup and they don't tie into the trends of like a pumpkin nut latte. They, they don't go down that route with their marketing because people who go there are there for the coffee. They're there yeah. for the product. So that's a, an idea of how the same demographic, coffee drinkers, can be attracted to two different psychographic alignments. Yeah, so with that, so the first part of this whole thing is that there needs to be a story involved. 
Um, and we always talk to coaches all the time about sharing your journey and why that's important. And, you know, you have to make sure that you're you're sharing that. And we've used a few examples there. Andrew Tate's one, shares his story. Um, but even that's the coffee thing, just to give you an insight there. So like when I first got into coffee, the reason I got into it was because that the one of the best coffee shops in Bath at the time where I lived was run by a world barista champion. He was a three-time world barista champion. Maxwell. Maxwell. Shout out to Maxwell. And he just genuinely gave such a shit about coffee. You could tell the way he did everything. And that's what got me into coffee and inspired me into it. There was obviously a Starbucks in Bath, but I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go there because of his his desire, his passion, and all that sort of stuff. It kind of like resonated with me a little bit in other areas. That's what it what it was. It was this part of the story that, that pulled me into that. Again, we talk about Andrew Tate. Again, not, not for me, not for probably most people watching this, right? But he has a powerful story. And the reason that he talks about his story, his journey all the time is it inspires certain people, right? Not us, not me, maybe not you, right? But it doesn't mean it's wrong. It's, it comes back to a story. He's not just sat shouting about all this sort of stuff. He's shouting about how his journey led him to here, why what he was doing led him to this point. So it's really important that you share your past journey, your present journey, your future journey, because that's what people align with throughout this sort of stuff, because it adds emotion to your brand and it makes you a personal brand versus just a, I sell coffee. Like Mike just said, why, why do people go to Starbucks versus, versus, um, you know, Cloner and Smalls? Why do they do it? What, what is the reasoning behind it? That's the thing. And it's based on the story and the journey that, that goes with that. So it's a huge, huge part of it. Um, to make sure that you're sharing what you're going through and, and what, you know, the, the path you're walking, because you may think it's boring, but you, when you break it down, you look at everyone else's content that you follow, you realize you follow them because of their journey. You'll see this a lot on, on even things like Dragon's Den, right? It's one of the the biggest points that you notice that the dragons make. Like next time that you watch it, um, for example, I, I think I was watching it last week or the week before, whenever it was, right? And I think I think there was like some form of skincare brand on there, and I think it was Deborah that said, um, "Okay, so skincare brand, uh, the skincare um, market is so saturated. So why are you different? What's your story?" And um, the lady said um, that she'd suffered severe, uh, like um, like a skin disorder, like acne, I'm guessing, or something like that, um, and had this real kind of like terrible backstory. And she'd gone from product to product to product, and nothing ever cleared it. And she'd been on um, whatever the, the medication, I think it's Rakitane or something along those lines. Really powerful. Isn't it? Yeah, really powerful. Came with different side effects, which led her to to start to develop this product specifically for her. And it's cleared her skin and she had great skin. And she's like, there, that's the story. She's like, okay, because this is powerful because you're then going to capture all of the other people mm -hmm. that f um, have had these issues that have tried Rakitane and it's too powerful and there's other symptoms of this and that and the other. That's the powerful part that people will buy into. So that's why the story is important. The second element of this is the ideology. So the ideology is about the mini missions that make up the bigger mission. So as coaches, you all have the same mission, right? You all want to get your clients in shape. That's the same mission. But your mini missions within that are what is what your ideology stands for. So when you take a look at us, we want to make you better. We want you to be a better coach. We want you to have better systems, onboarding. We want you to market better. We want you to be yourself online. Like that's the mission, right? Which you would probably guess that every other mentor's mission should be the same. It, it should be the same. Well, isn't it make as much money as possible? I think yeah. That's there. <laughs> Some people are like that. <laughs> Can't be but, a lot of money. But the mini mission, the ideology, is how we go about achieving that. So our ideology is we don't cold DM. We don't hire VAs. Um, we don't sell up front. That we are not sleazy and spammy and we don't tie people into contracts. Like that's how we start to do things. That's our ideology. So again, to put this into like coaching terms you could do for example getting somebody in photo shoot shape without using drugs and without sacrificing your entire life is different to just getting somebody in photo shoot shape right mm -hmm. it's a different ideology it's the same goal it's the same it's the same um, big mission but it's the mini mission um giving out safe and practical um pd advice that focuses on health first is different to um, giving out PED advice to achieve the best aesthetic result possible to get first place on stage. It's very, very different things, but yet it's the same. So you need to have an ideology because it's the ideology that people will buy into. Everybody knows that you're a coach, but what separates you from the next coach, from the next coach, from the next coach, from the next coach? It's the mini missions that make up your coaching that separates you, that people will buy into. How do you do things? Why do you do it? I'm guessing... 
we give one-to-one support. We give video updates. We receive video updates. We track all of your data. You get an update every week. You get tech support. You get your training plans. You get my WhatsApp number. You get somebody that understands you. You get somebody with the same mission and the same journey. You've got the same values. You've got the same sense of humor. You've got all of the things that align psychographically. Those are things, because in a, what's becoming a saturated to some degree industry, but still a very low com- competition, I would say, it, it's saturated to some degree. You have to have these mini missions, this ideology of how you're going to get them the result. Just a, again, this example of this in action is that I, I had, I've had multiple coaches actually say to me on, on consultation calls when I've spoke to them, they've said to me, I've sort of said, I'll say, why are we here on this call kind of thing? And they've said to me that, well, you've never called the end me. You never forced me into anything. Um, and you've never made me feel like um, you weren't just a human being. And I want to get the same thing for my business. That's what they said to me. So like, that's an ideology in, in, in action, essentially, is that, yes, it, it takes a little bit of time to kind of come up with these things and what you believe is an ideology for you. But at no point did they say, oh, um, because you told me that I can go my business from here to here. They've connected on that thing of going, well, these are the things you stand for and I want to stand for them as well. I think that's really, really important. Um, the next point of this is like, it's what we call the symbol, but it kind of relates probably the least to online coaching, um, which is where you have a really strong brand that obviously goes beyond just their product. So for example, um, Apple has a very, very strong brand. Now, just because you don't have a MacBook doesn't mean you might not have an iPhone or doesn't mean you might have an iPod Shuffle. They have almost like things within the brand about what it means. And there's an element of, you know what that symbol stands for. So other examples are Ferrari, they sell clothing. You know, people may never buy a Ferrari in their life, can't afford one, but they want to feel like they're part of the brand so they might buy their clothing harley davidson do this um i know people do like the hard rock cafe it's not really renowned for its amazing food but people love going to it because of the symbol of the hard rock cafe and what it stands for there's one in all the major cities across the world and they collect um, memorabilia from each one that they go to for example there's loads of different examples around that ours obviously is the symbol of the colors you know what that looks like when you're on our page but really the other two points are more important for a lot of online coaches the symbol is obviously a little bit less important i believe for online coaches or, or we believe for online coaches so i don't think you need to stress hugely about it but i do think that throughout your branding there needs to be some continuity again within some of the colors or even names like again with us with blitz we had blitz it was what we called it we didn't just say eight week fat loss program it was called something those things start to then mean something and people can associate that symbol or that name with what you do yeah i i'd, I'd say it's probably least uh, least important um but it doesn't mean that it's unimportant. Um, again, having a strong, like like you said, the colours, our blue, our specific blue and our specific yellow t- match together, you would probably recognise if you saw it through your feed and it would kind of be one of ours. I'm sure that if you saw, you know, other people using the same branding, you go, that looks like bicep semantic stuff. Um, or we would hope. Um, the next one um, that the book kind of covered was like shared rituals again. Not a huge importance to online coaching, but can still have some... Um, have some relevance so like shared rituals to build psychographic alignment is like dan kind of covered earlier is for example somebody going to a football stadium every saturday wearing the same colors singing the same songs and you feel part of that community and it grows um the connection to that particular brand in this uh, you know in this um case it would be the football team would be the brand you see it with uh, Starbucks. Um, everybody has a shared ritual of taking a picture of the Starbucks cup because they've written your name on it or maybe they've spelt your name wrong or something like that. They do this for a reason. There's a reason why they write on the cup. It's for you to take a picture of it. It's a shared ritual. It's expected that you take a picture of it. You see bars and restaurants that have now got these like flower walls with like the neon signs that you'll see influencers take pictures in front of. So the shared ritual, it's just the, it's just what you do when you go to this restaurant or that bar. You have that picture there and it's got the angel wings behind and girls do it. Again, it's great marketing, but it also builds that brand. So how this could relate to you is um, it could be something that you have within um, your onboarding. It could be that you always do the same thing with each of them so that when they come to, to your coaching, that this is what they're expected. They're expected to do that because they've seen other people do that. It could be that you run regular events events for us we um have got in <laughs> gotten into beer pong um just picking it up but we've kind of made that a thing out of nothing we realize that we're pretty good um well world champions is what we are world champion beer pong players um thing. so we realize that we're pretty good and because we're pretty good we just continue to play on it to the point where it's probably expected now that when you come to our events you're going to be playing us at beer pong so i'm 
guessing that people will then lose to us at beer pong. Yeah, lose to us at beer pong. So I'm guessing that people are going to want to share that. And it's a a ritual that's within the brand that it actually doesn't mean anything, but it's just something that's expected. And again, how we even deliver the coaching and the service is almost like a shared ritual because you know what you're coming in to expect. It's the same thing. Do your followers on Instagram know what they would expect when they come to your coaching? Do they know what they would get? Do they know what happens on a week to week basis? Do they see what your other clients are doing? You need to to, to kind of start to develop and, and weave in some of these like shared rituals that other people can kind of um, align with somebody else doing the same thing. So the reason why we did the photo shoots, when we used to run, for, oh, well we still do, we run photo shoots with our clients, is that, there would be a certain bond that is developed through them sharing the ritual of doing a photo shoot, giving up food, shaving their legs, getting a tan, standing in front of a camera, to the point where they then felt connected more so to one another and to us because of that shared ritual of doing it. Blitzers, same thing. Yeah. yeah. They're all on the same journey. It's a shared ritual of doing the same thing. Yeah. And and the next one really is, is probably our favorite one, which is like the enemy. Correct. Um, and people think of this and they think, oh, I don't want to slag people off. Well, it's not about people. It's about something. You have to stand yeah. against something. And every single person you see at the moment who's grown on Instagram is doing this. Eddie Abu, prime example, right? His enemy is shit food or what he does, it seems shit food. He's got a catchphrase, this is shit, right? He goes in supermarkets, been thrown out of Tesco's because his enemy is supermarkets, right? And that kind of thing. The irony is he shops in supermarkets. But anyway, um, Lane Norton does it, biohackers, he hates all the Huberman Lab and all these sorts of people. He's on a Huberman Lab podcast, so they're not longer. But anyway, he, he goes more for the Paul Sandino, Saladino, all these people that say- Gary Brecker. Yeah, Gary Brecker, you know, the ones that are, you know, stupid. And I agree with them, to be fair, to a certain degree. Ben Carpenter obviously hates the bad diet advice, and he's sort of moved a little bit more towards hating people who fat shame people as well, a little bit more recently. I've seen a lot of Joe Wicks when he was big, it was, oh, low-intensity cardio is making you fat, blah, blah, blah. You can also go after people, like we just said. There's some people there that are going after people, but you know, even bigger, broader topics. Think about politics. Think about Brexit. All that sort of stuff. Like a lot of politics is the same sort of thing, right? You need to create your own enemy. You need to create your own thing. So for us, our enemy are mentors that tell you to cold DM and charge up front, and then act, give you absolutely zero support whatsoever, and effectively conning you out of your money. That's our enemy, and we talk passionately about it all the time. The reason why it's our enemy is not because of the specific people. That's the thing. Like. There's part of that, like some of them are dickheads, but there's other people that are probably actually sound blokes, like just being straight up, they're probably all right, you know? It's just that their ideology, it ties back into their ideology, it's their ideology is different, and we don't agree with the principles that that they're, you know, using within their business. So from our experience, we don't think that over a long period of time, cold DMing works. Over our experience, we don't agree with tying people into three-month minimum term contracts or with an upfront payment. In our experience, we don't think that scaling your business to grow a team when you are doing eight, nine, ten k a month is probably the best thing because it's not what we did. So we're going to have an ideology and values that align with the things that we did and the trends that we've seen within within our clients. So our enemy, as such is we're anti all of those other things, because of course it would be, because it makes sense to be. We're not going to suddenly change our values. So we've spent the last six, seven years in fitness doing the same thing, building a business that way and go, well, now we're mentors. Now we're going to change our opinions and go, well, actually, we think you should charge up front and you should hire a VA. Well, that'd be disingenuous because we didn't do any of that. So of course we're going to be anti that. People think that we're calling out people. And to some degree, we'll call out some shady tactics, But it's more so principles. You have to stand for something so that people have something to align with. Saying very clearly, here's what we're not, by definition tells people what you also are. You can do that too. Here's what I don't do. I'm not a coach that fobs you off with one WhatsApp text per week and gives you the same training plan as your mate. That is not calling anybody specifically out, but it's saying what you don't do. So it leads them to think about what you do do. I said do do. Do do. Um, But also as well, it's easier for people to bond um, over things they don't like as much as what they do. And, and people hear the enemy and they think, oh, I'm just not confrontational. I'm just not. And I'm like, well, that's, this is half your problem is that you think that by enemy, we think you have to swear on camera, shout and scream. And it's like, Attack. if that's your interpretation of that, then you need to rethink what standing for something means. Because I can give you loads of examples of peaceful protesters, protesters who stand for something, who don't scream and shout, who don't swear, right? But it's the, it's the common thing that they talk about and talk against. So for example, you say you're a, a female coach who believes that um, you should never have to count calories to lose weight. Well, you've got an enemy. Calorie counting. That's your enemy. 
you might not think you and you might talk very very openly about how you know that you know it's you, you're very nice you're sensitive you're kind you're caring you can be that way and have an enemy people just associate an enemy with a bad thing they associate with them being horrible to someone and it's like that is your interpretation of it then we need to rethink that a little bit over time because you have to stand for something because you stand for and against calorie counting or diet culture Talk about it often, right? And you need to have more than one as well. Like we have one or two enemy sort of principles that we have. But if you look throughout a lot of our content, there's also things that we stand for and against outside of fitness as well that you would know about from knowing us and liking us um, that would seep through some of our other content as well, which is really important. You put across those opinions so that people can know, like, and trust you because of what you don't support. Because people will look at it and go, right, if they don't stand for that, but like Mike said, by definition, I know that they probably do stand for these things, which is just as useful. Um yeah, like, again, if you kind of, like, um, zoom out, you might think that you don't stand for or not stand for anything, but if you zoom right out, if you're not racist, you your enemy is people that are racist. You don't stand for racism. You might not think anything of it because you're not racist. Same with homophobia or sexism and so on and so forth. There is somebody that has an opposing opinion, and there always will be, no matter how genuine your opinion is. Again, I think we, we did this one thing before where you type in cute, cutest puppy in the world on YouTube and it's got fucking 100,000 dislikes because people just like to have an opposing view on something. People just like the negative side of things. So you need to find things that you do stand for. And I would probably, I would say, jot down all of the things that you do and the, the values that you have and the beliefs that you have and then think about what the opposite of that might be and it's those principles that you should be kind of going against i always remember having a conversation with amelia thompson and obviously she goes if you don't know amelia which you, you probably probably do i think most people in the fitness industry um kind of are aware of amelia but um she stands for like mindful intuitive eating and being kinder to I guess your body and um, and taking that kind of almost holistic approach to, to nutrition and she was very much that way within her content because that's the type of person that needs to hear her content but I remember having a conversation with her and she said around 40 to 50 percent of her clients she actually gets to track their food but yet she wouldn't be putting out content around tracking instead her marketing is very biased towards the the values and the enemy that she's against the enemy that she's against i believe to some degree is like how bodybuilding can ruin your um relationship with yourself with your food etc that's kind of like the enemy that she's going for but then it's almost a case of like sell them what they want or tell them what they want on, on the marketing and then give them what they need. For some people, they might actually need to be tracking at this current moment in time. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with you. And again, I spoke this morning to one of my clients that actually does need to have a type form application and he does need to have a VA now. He's got a hundred and odd thousand followers and he's getting so many inquiries that a lot of them are garbage and he can't respond to messages enough, right? A lot of them are falling into his requests and he's just not doing it. For him, I'm going to use that. Is that going to mean that I'm going to change the marketing? No, of course I'm not going to change the marketing. Because for 99% of coaches, here's what I believe in. Does it mean that we're so stuck in our ways that we don't see certain things at certain times for certain people? Of course not. So you've just got to think about that within your marketing. Because it then attracts the people that have got the same things that are in line with you. Yeah, the next one then is sort of like common language as well. So like there are a lot of people, a lot of good organizations sort of have insider language. And then it's, you see this a lot in sort of marketing and copywriting, especially like someone will go, oh, my spoof method of client acquisition. And everyone's like, what's that? And it's like just an acronym for whatever they decide. I just pick spoof randomly. Um, like, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ones in fitness. Rapid recomp is one, you know, fit training system, my 90 day, you know, uh, P90X is one, I suppose, you know, the, the mm -hmm. 90 day thing. There's loads of it within, within the fitness industry. Um, so what did Joe, what was Joe Wicks's one on Instagram? He did just do 15 second recipes, didn't he? Lean in 15. Of, lean in 15, there you go. It's that whole thing of like, people can then say, oh, you're doing lean in 15, are oh, you doing that? And it feels like sometimes if you don't know it, you're missing out on it. So you want to get involved in these sorts of things. That's a lot, a lot of it in marketing is, it's that my method of doing this is different. And reality is every fitness program is a calorie deficit and, and training, right? <laughs> of course it is. But it's how you package that and the way you make it look. And sometimes the insider language can be really, really helpful. Um, just adds intrigue a lot of the time with it. I think that's the, the key thing is it's that people then part of the group and community feel like they know what that means and they're part of the little gang of people who know what it means. Um, CrossFit do this really, really well as well with the wear acronyms for their fucking things. Um, don't even know what half it means when I see it written out on the board sometimes. Mm. Um, but that's what they do because they all know it. So it makes sense to them. It's their own little language. Mm. So they feel a part of it. Um, so that is is something that you can do within your business. Again, as you grow bigger and, and stuff like that. But you know you can do that within within loads of stuff that you do. 
um, in jokes, all that sort of stuff, you can you can do. Um, that works quite well. Hola, mate. Hola, mate. Yeah. Hola, mate. That's um, one. that's that's one of them. Again, it, it's not so much a insider um, language thing. It's more yeah, joke. but it's it's it's. I've got people who are not clients who would message me, hola, mate, just based off of one video that we did, um, which is really really good from a marketing perspective is that they've consumed the 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 video they find it funny otherwise they wouldn't be messaging me and they've probably got experience of potentially the tactics that we're talking around so it's really really good for marketing purposes and again it's just that the little inside kind of like community thing of like an in joke it makes people feel included within that joke so yeah like dan said you can kind of use specific things and you'll see mentors do this a lot um we probably don't do it as much as maybe what we could do but you'll see the you know the the rapid um client accelerator trademarked system right and you go oh, what's that and you go oh it's just send some dms um it's it's designed there to make you feel like it's, it's always sent some dms in it that's it's always, always sent <laughs> but the uh the, the last thing that the book covered was was the leader so it's, it's almost similar to the the story the story is a little bit more origin based but then the leader in terms of these principles in psychographic alignment will be that they the the client or the um, yeah, let's just let's just say client because it's this is what we refer to feels like the leader can take them through their own journey. I think that we do this quite well because we are we are the origin story plus the leader that helps them through their through your coaching. If you are a client, where I believe that other mentors might slip up on this is that they may well have a decent origin story story, but actually they lack the leader ability because they outsource their coaching to somebody who hasn't got the same origin story. I, it's probably quite inspiring to see somebody build a seven-figure business. Great, I'm going to work with them. Oh, I've got given this person who has only done, has only got 30 clients. Mm, not the same. Correct. That's one of the biggest problems that we see with what uh, what other people do is that you never get access to the actual leader, and, and that's the bit that inspires people. I think that's the, the the main thing that a lot of people get wrong with their own business is that they they fail to put across. So this links a little bit to like your personal journey and sharing that side of stuff. Is that to peep to the to these followers that you have, you are a leader, you are inspiring. So I get that a lot from coaches like, oh, I just don't feel like my story is that inspiring, or you know that um, my my physique isn't that good, or or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but you were once thirty stone, and you are now not 30 stone you still train you still go into the gym you still do the right things by still being that leader to your followers you still have to turn up every day and talk about that and talk about your journey and all those sorts of things it links in a little bit to that to that journey um but i think like i said the, the leader is often wants to overcome a lot of these challenges and overcome a lot of these issues um and that's what people want access to they want the, access to that person the leader in this is usually like um an aspirational or an attractive character that is also a, a servant. Probably a new. Um, that is also a servant. So essentially the the idea is that the person is there to make the, the client or the, um, let's just say member, in politics it would be the member of the public, that they're making the member of the public the hero. So whatever policies that the leader stands for, it in some way benefits the member of the public. For example, some people might want to pay less tax. So by voting for this leader of this uh, specific um, party, that they're, they're becoming the leader of their journey, of their story, for example, because they want to pay less tax. It suits their narrative. Some people want tighter laws on immigration, so they'll vote for this specific party and this specific leader because the leader is there to serve the ideas and the interests of the the, ge the general public based on psychographic alignment. So what specific policies that you would align with, what specific traits, what specific values and beliefs you align with. Again, you see this really strongly in America with Donald Trump. He's obviously not scared to put his opinion a, a, across with some of, you know, the, the the ideas that he has. And again, it creates that very, very strong psychographic alignment with the people that feel that Donald Trump is a figure that is aspirational, that is leading, but that will also serve them to become the, the, the hero of their own story for them to have um, more relaxed gun laws or um, tighter border control or whatever it is that Donald Trump's policies are, you know, um, without going too much into that. That's the idea of the leader behind psychographic alignment. It's this almost like idolized figure that makes you feel like you're going along the journey with them. He's teetotal. Do you know that? No. Donald Trump doesn't drink. Really? Wouldn't have put that down, would you? I wouldn't have said that. 
No. It was a drink. So there you go. Um, imagine what a, trouble you'd get into if you did. Thought it uh, would have been a whiskey man <laughs> myself. Yeah. Um, anyway, hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was useful. If you did find it useful, make sure you hit subscribe because we've realised that 95% of people who watch this video, all nine and a half of you, don't subscribe. So make sure you do. Um, so you can get the next one. And if you are interested in learning more about this sort of stuff and having some help alongside all this psychographic, alongside your niche, alongside onboarding, marketing, Instagram, join the members group. It's £99 a month. Get in now before the price goes up, maybe in the future. Who knows? It might do, it might not. Just saying, get in now. You may as well. Worth it.